Uh, three, two, one. Yolanda, please welcome our speaker. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Ishanu Chatarodapai. He's a professor at the University of Chicago. Ishanu has done a lot of uh, great work on uh, machine learning approaches to handle uh, tremendous amounts of data, particularly complex time series data. And uh, this is uh, extremely relevant to our work on uh, geosciences. Uh, Ishanu, go ahead. Okay, uh, so you can see my screen. I'm, I haven't used this system before, so can you see yes, my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Um, so the title of the talk uh, was supposed to be longer than this, but just to fit it in the slide, I kind of shortened it a little bit. So we're going to talk about essentially modeling complex, complex multi-scale phenomena. And uh, uh, one note, uh, as you see, my department, home department is, is medicine, which is um, kind of in not, does, is not descriptive of what I do. As Yolanda said, my background is in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And uh, I am interested basically in data. I tend to care less where the data comes from. Uh, I am more concerned with what I can do with it, what questions I can answer. And um, uh, in 2018, with our access to really huge amounts of data uh, in the fields of uh, geosciences, uh, medicine, uh, social sciences, there's, uh, uh, it's not difficult to, to find problems where um, you can use interesting ways of uh, analyzing or, or asking or answering questions. So, um, Today, what we are going to focus on is uh, how do we learn patterns from uh, essentially spatiotemporal data logs. The seismic catalogs, for example, um, is an example of such uh, a data source, right? You have time, location, magnitude of events, and uh, we want to distill uh, predictive models from such, uh, from such a database. So, this work, which uh, is been going on for some time, a, a couple of years or two or three years. Uh, it is in collaboration with uh, Marion Angle, who is a staff scientist at Los Alamos, Yehuda, who is actually in USC in geophysics, and Hod Lipson, um, who is in Colombia. So, uh, seismic prediction. Essentially, at the end of the day, we want to see how well we can predict seismic events, really. Uh, but apart from that, instead of just making this uh, a kind of a blind prediction exercise, we'd also try to answer important questions, uh, questions important to geophysics. For example, do faults interact over vast distances or over extended time periods? Now, if you look at li in the literature, there is some evidence to that effect, but there's really uh, a lack of consensus. So what we will be able to do by your analysis is to kind of definitively show that, um, yeah, if you, if you include interaction over long distances and over extended time periods, then you can uh, vastly improve your predictions. Uh, we'll come to that. Now, for seismic prediction, essentially what you're talking about is learning uh, or modeling a stochastic process, right? And um, in many such instances where uh, you are trying to learn a stochastic system, it is either very difficult or even impossible to approach the problem from first principle equations or first principle understanding, say, of physics. Um, and, uh, and the reasons should be quite obvious. While uh, the entire dynamics, the seismic dynamics, is uh, governed by the equations of solid mechanics, there are many, many, many parameters. Uh, many of them we cannot possibly measure to actually just to solve the equations uh, and also the intricate uh, boundary conditions. So that's not going to be very useful. So the question is, uh, can we apply some kind of machine inference approach or machine learning uh, to the observational data stream? And uh, how, how, how far, how far would we get if, if we apply, if you, if you come from that, that approach? Right. And you see here, uh, kind of what the data looks like. I guess uh, uh, this particular audience is very, familiar with this kind of data. So this is uh, all events, I think, I think all events, uh, above magnitude uh, two from uh, 1970, 2013. 
in about a 300 square mile uh, spatial tile around those coordinates. And those coordinates correspond to, I think, just off the coast of California, uh, Southern California. So it's, it's a very stochastic process. It's not, so you can't fit curves or uh, you, have to, you, have to be, you have to be careful how you learn or model uh, such a system. So how do, how do we learn stochastic processes? Right? If you, uh, clearly a stochastic process is not something like this. It's not a deterministic signal with observational noise. It uh, looks something like this. Essentially, you're looking at a sample path of an underlying stochastic generator. So you can't uh, fit curves to it or do simple regressions because next time you look, come and look at it, its sample path could have changed. Essentially, you have to model the underlying stochastic generator. And uh, so, so how, 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 uh, how do we do that? How do we go about modeling uh, stochastic processes? Now, there was a word in the title, it's said zero knowledge. So I didn't, go, I didn't really explain what that is. So one of the things that um, I do or I like to do in my work uh, is to get rid of magic numbers. So zero knowledge doesn't mean that you magically come up with uh, uh, predictions or inferences without having any data input. It's not that. What it is, is it's a, a minimization or elimination of what is technically known as hyperparameters. So essentially everything that you infer, models, model structures, or parameters, is, learn, is learned from the data itself. There's no uh, external domain expertise that uh, you need to take, a, take, you need to kind of use to uh, figure out things about the models that you learn. So that's, that's the hope, that's what I like to do. And um, if you want to go uh, that route, the question is how do we learn stochastic processes? Again, that's, that's kind of, what is the framework to learn? If you're not going to assume model structures, if you're not going to assume model families, how do we even start learning a stochastic process? So let's start with a very simple stochastic process with the coin flip. And if you think, if you see on the right, uh, that pretty much is an exact, uh, model of such a system. It was an unbiased coin. Essentially, you can think of that as a single state uh, process with uh, the heads and tails, the outcomes occurring in an equiprobable manner, and there's no memory. That's why it's single state. It's essentially an IID process. Uh, same, same thing happens if you have a 1D random walk where you're kind of deciding to go left or right, flipping a coin and take, making a decision. And uh, again, the model on the right is really an exact uh, representation of the dynamics. But the question is, if you, uh, instead of having those cartoons, if you actually had uh, a sample path, say the distance traveled uh, when, you, when someone is executing that random walk, if you have that data stream as shown on the, uh, on the left, multiple sample paths, can you actually infer the correct model as shown on the right from the data alone mm -hmm. without being told that uh, it had a single state or, uh, or, or any other, any other uh, or without having any more information. And that's what uh, we can do, actually. Now, before we go into that, uh, note that your processes can be more complex than just IID. It can have two states, as an example, as, 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 as this, where the next symbol distribution is determined by the last symbol that you observe or even more complex where the next symbol distribution is determined by the last two symbols. It can be arbitrarily complex. So there can be arbitrary number of states, finite, and there can be, uh, there can be uh, arbitrary re like ways uh, in which those states are wired, the transitions, uh, and so on. So essentially this, uh, this kind of models are probabilistic, uh, essentially fall in the category of probabilistic finite automata. And just to make sure we're on the same page, uh, this is what essentially the, the, the framework looks like. There's a state states, and there's an alphabet, and there are essentially there are there are probabilities on those edges, which tell you what the uh, probability of those particular uh, symbols that label the edges are. Right. So whenever I talk about this framework, the question that comes up is: Is it just a, a Markov uh, chain? Uh, sure. Since uh, it has states, then uh, there is the Markov property, but it is somewhat distinct from standard, uh, just a, a, from a standard Markov chain, because those edges are labeled by symbols from the alphabet, right? Uh, in the context of the uh, seismic uh, time series, you would see those those uh, symbols are essentially quantized magnitudes, and um, 
the states are not that important really the states are interpreted as uh, uh, how those symbol streams essentially um, move around the model so in a standard markov chain the states are very important they're the, the most important things here what is more important uh, is the structure of the model the transition probabilities and the wirings you can actually change the uh, the, the structure of the graph in interesting ways while representing the same dynamics. Anyway, the takeaway is that there is there are some differences from the standard Markov chain model. And um, essentially what we are claiming is that given a data stream like this, as shown on the top, you can infer an optimal uh, stochastic generator as shown at the bottom. And the thing to note here, here's where this notion of zero knowledge learning comes in, as I talked, to, I talked about very briefly, uh, like a few minutes back. Um, the, 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 input, the input to the learning system is simply that a data stream. There's, you don't know how many states there are, you don't know how they're wired, and you all obviously don't know the transition probabilities. So you infer everything from the data itself, right? Uh, how do we do that? Actually, it's very simple how to do that. Uh, proving that it actually works is harder. The algorithm itself is, is quite simple. Uh, we make use of something called uh, symbolic derivatives, which is, uh, which is um, without going into a definition, it is something like this. Uh, if you see a sequence 1100, zero, zero, what is the probability that the next symbol is 1 as opposed to being 0, right? And uh, that distribution is called symbolic derivative at 1100. Zero, zero. And how, we, how do we find it? We just go about looking for 1100 zero, zero in the input data stream, see how many times you get a zero and how many times you get a one, normalize the count, and if you have a long enough data stream, then that empirical estimate starts converging and you get a symbolic derivative, uh, the symbolic derivative at one, one, zero, zero. Now you can construct symbolic derivatives at many different uh, sequences, sequence fragments, and create this table. And once you have this table, the lambda is actually this, uh, the symbolic derivative at the empty word when you haven't observed anything. And if you think about it, that's just a symbol of frequency. And once you have this, uh, start having this table, of course, the table would be, uh, in theory, infinite, but you have just a finite data stream, so you will run out of um, data to construct these things. But once you have this table, you can start building your model. You start with a single state and level it with the empty word lambda and uh, check what's the symbolic derivative from the table you constructed at lambda. In this case, it's 0.75, uh, 0.24, that's the first row. And then you look at the symbolic derivative at the string that follows the empty string in lexicographical ordering, in this case, zero. And you see the symbolic derivative is not the same as that for lambda. So, that, so, so you create a new state, which looks like this. Then you look at the next uh, sequ uh, sequence, in this case, one, and you see that creates, or that has, a, that has a different symbolic derivative than either of the last two, and so you create a new state one. But then things start getting interesting where you see uh, you do not need to create any more new states because symbolic derivative at zero, zero matches up very closely with that with zero. So essentially it produces a loop, and in this way, if you see, the model kind of closes on itself. And if you assume that your process is, is, uh, is roughly ergodic and quasi-stationary, then you can uh, eliminate the states which are not visited beyond a finite number of times, in this case, the lambda, and uh, again, assuming ergodicity and stationarity is quite simple to, to infer the transition probabilities. You just select a state, uh, go uh, pass your uh, data stream through the model, and count how many times each edge is traversed and normalize the count, and that will give you an estimate, an empirical estimate of the transition probabilities. So, so that's kind of a, a very simple uh, description of how you can actually infer this kind of stochastic generators uh, given data streams. And uh, I'm gonna skip that. The point is that you didn't assume really anything about the system other than it is somewhat ergodic, it's ergodic and, and quasi stationary. Um, but as the complexity of, this, uh, of the system, which is generating a data stream, increases, your uh, inferred model also changes. And that gives us a very powerful way of inferring uh, general stochastic processes, uh, processes which, are, uh, which particularly have this kind of uh, a finite value, essentially. Um, so applying this to, say, seismic data streams, um, 
and this will produce a very simple model. This is not going to allow us to do too much prediction yet. We'll come to that in a moment. Uh, but you look at, uh, again, that 36 degree, 120 degrees uh, location and about 300 square miles around that, consider that spatial tile and consider uh, all events that were recorded uh, within that 30 year period. Um, assume a quantization, an event quantization, um, I think, what was used in the paper for this, for, for California, for, for, for this region is about, the quantization is about 4.2 on the Richter scale. So any event that is under 4.2 was mapped to zero, and any event above was mapped to one. So that is kind of uh, less than what, less resolution than what we need for sending out alarms, but it still allows us to do quite some very interesting things. So if you do that, uh, if you reduce that uh, event stream to this kind of, symbolic sequence and pass it through the algorithm, what you get is a model as shown on the top. Uh, it's a very simple model. We call it a, call it a self model because you are looking at data from one spatial tile and predicting what's going to happen in that tile itself. So it's kind of self prediction. We're going to go into cross predictions uh, in, in a moment. But you get this model and the question is, uh, is this any good? Clearly, it is too simple to actually give you any predictions, but still, is it, uh, can we do some kind of sanity check? Uh, and we can, Mr. Move, can I ask a question real quick? Yes. Can, is that figure that, we just, that you just showed, does it change with time? Yes, if you, uh, in, this case, in this case, what I'm showing uh, is kind of a sanity check. So we use the entire data that we had available um, uh, to construct this, but if you construct it, uh, with uh, a different time epochs. Suppose we construct with data from 1970 to 1980, or 1970 to 75, 75 to 80, 80 to okay. that is going to change. Thank you. And we can also, also infer uh, what those time periods should be, when the data is roughly stationary or not. When it is rapidly uh, kind of changing, you probably should not assume that the data is stationary and model it. So we can actually, the algorithm can actually pick up on that, that the data is, uh, uh, the system is not is violating the assumptions which is required for it to essentially give you a, a like a stable model. Thank you. So one of the uh, sanity check that we can do with this is to uh, is to is to like uh, validate. I don't, I don't think validate is the right word here. Uh, the Omari Utsu law, which um, I guess again this audience is probably very familiar with it. It's the, the frequency of events that goes up uh, near. Uh, uh, a large event and goes down after, right? And we can actually validate that. The, the exponents that we find, the, the, the decay curves, match up very well with what uh, people have inferred from the catalogs. So that kind of gives us some idea, some, uh, some uh, faith that uh, what our, models, our, our model is kind of capturing things that uh, you'd like to. It's still too simple to actually do prediction. To do prediction, you... Uh, have to infer many, many, many more models. One of the things that we have to incorporate is this uh, interdependence. So does uh, seismic dynamics of the coast of Australia affect things in California? We don't know, but we have to, but, it, but we'll find out. It seems like it does, but we don't know at the, at the outset. Um, also, we can just uh, infer one model to predict the next time step. It turns out that it is much more useful or uh, important uh, in some sense to uh, have uh, a family of models, each of which tries to predict at different time delays in future. So bring that together, if you have, uh, say, a couple of thousand seismically active tiles over the planet, and uh, if you're looking at uh, uh, models which predict at different time delays, together they create, uh, you have to actually infer really millions of models. Uh, we'll come to that in a moment, how many models we infer. But this inferring this cross-dependence, just a quick word on that, is actually very similar to what I described for the self-models, except now, instead of trying to predict uh, symbols in the same stream, we want to predict symbols in a second or target stream. Right. And uh, while these models that we infer are generative, in the sense that if you give me uh, a data stream as input and give me the, the uh, this cross-dependency model, I can estimate what would be the behavior at the, in the target stream. So they are essentially probabilistic transducers. You can they kind of generalize transfer functions, if you may. 
but there's also a scalar number, a scalar characterization of these models, which captures, or which quantifies the amount of information uh, this cross-dependence actually is conveying. Right? That's, we call that the coefficient of causality. Essentially, it's the uh, expected change in uncertainty of the immediate future in the target stream when you make observations over when you do not make any observations. And you can actually compute that. It's a non-dimensional number. It's a bit by bit. So a gamma of 0.3 or one third would mean that every three bits you observe in the source stream, you get one bit in the target stream. So that, as I said, it allows us to kind of infer um, lots and lots of models. And how many models will, uh, in our test system, we infer about 3.5 million models. The compute time was about, was about 30,000 core hours. And even when we threw away models with a uh, coefficient of causality less than 0 0.01, we still ended up with roughly 200,000 models. Now, it turns out that once you have all these models, which are kind of feeding each other and it's forming this giant uh, network, and, and remember, each of these links in this network, there is a gen on, on each of these links in this network, there is a generative model, this probabilistic transducers, cross models or self models, uh, so, if you, when, once you observe new data, you can actually run this network forward and it starts giving you predictions about future. Right. So those predictions are, are very interesting and important and we'll come to that in a moment. But the structure of the network that we infer is also instructive. So once we, uh, once we have this network and we ask what are the locations around the world which uh, in, uh, influence California, we get a picture like this. And the algorithm had no idea about tectonics or plates, but it turns out that it essentially infers uh, the boundary of the, of the Pacific plate. And uh, those are the locations which are more important, stronger influence, and uh, it turns out that right off the northern part of Australia is where most of the influence is coming from. It's kind of interesting. I have, I have no idea what that means though. And uh, you can see on the top right, the ROC, the AUC actually, I shouldn't, shouldn't have said ROC. The AUC, there you under the curve, distribution of the, of the, of the play, of the tiles we considered across the, across the globe. And the, the average uh, AUC is about 90% out of sample. Uh, and, the and the spatial and temporal quantization, it's important to say that, what that is. So the temporal quantization is about one week, and the spatial quantization is roughly about plus minus, I think, two degrees, which is which amounts to roughly uh, 300 square miles. Um, we do uh, assume that we got the prediction right if we, if we miss by one plus minus one week. So it boils down to about a three week special, a temporal quantization and 300 square miles of, um, of spatial quantization. And the magnitude quantization varies uh, more as seismically active as a place is. You can uh, uh, track uh, like larger events, larger means uh, higher magnitude events. If it is less uh, seismically active, that comes down. So for example, in California, while California, Southern California is quite active, it's not as active as Chile or Japan, and uh, we can only use a, quanti a binary quantization with the uh, event um, uh, quantization at 4.2, a magnitude of 4.2. So that is not as great as it can be. Uh, that's not enough to send out alarms. Uh, but the thing to note here is that this is not a fundamental restriction of the algorithm. It's just about, this is dictated by the amount of data we have. So as we collect more and more data, uh, this, uh, we, we, we are going to be able to have finer event quantizations and track the, the higher magnitude events. The only reason we can't predict or say much about the higher magnitude events is because they are uh, much rarer. So there's the, so, so to kind of model their statistics is difficult, the amount of data that, that we have available up till now. Up till now. So, so is the, the cross models or the links or um, the, the question that I asked at the beginning is uh, do faults interact over long distances? So uh, the way the, it, it translates to this, that if you only use self models, is that enough? Or do we actually need the cross models? And the answer is we do need the cross models. You see in, in sample, uh, accuracy in sample AUC uh, in California is an example. It's kind of, this is a representative result uh, for other locations as well. Uh, if you just use self models, you get a much lower performance. If you use cross models, you get a much higher performance. So uh, it's just seen that by taking into account 
uh, long range interactions, your prediction, uh, your model modeling doesn't prove. Uh, how much time uh, or memory, uh, temporal memory, does uh, the system have? Uh, it seems like it's roughly about 10 years. Uh, as we include more and more models with more and more time delays, you get better and better performance. It kind of levels out around 10 to 12 years, which actually matches very well with what is known in literature. So the inferred global network is, is kind of messy. If you just look at all the links, these are the top 21 percent of the connections. There's not much insight you can have by just looking at the links. Uh, but if you look at the average connections between the tectonic plates, you see that they mostly connect, connect to their neighboring plates, which uh, is what you would expect. And what kind of predictive accuracy do you have? So there's a couple of results uh, at different locations where we have had uh, large events. And these are all out of sample prediction. The, the red line that you see is a threshold computed from the, um, from, the AUC, from the ROC curve, so the optimal thresholds in some sense. And uh, you see that we get very good performance. So the gray bars are where the actual events happened. Uh, the red spheres are where the algorithm predicted events, given that threshold. And the green uh, spheres are where the algorithm said there would be no event. So we have some uh, false alarms. And, but there's no missed events. That's not always, always the case. Actually, there is a missed event. There's one missed event, as you can see. Uh, third bar was missed. Um, a different location. Again, we do pretty well. There is a, fault, there is a small uh, false positive rate uh, and false negative rates, uh, but it's kind of uh, really uh, quite drastically improves what is uh, possible with the state of the art. Uh, and in Japan, uh, and uh, when you have obvious, really obvious uh, signals, it does really, really well, so for example, in this case. Uh, and, and remember, this is all out of sample data. So the training was done with data before uh, this time. So one point, one other point to note here is uh, I talked about the spatial and temporal quantizations, uh, spatial quantization of 300 square, roughly 200 square miles, temporal quantization is uh, uh, plus minus one week, so about three weeks. Uh, but the time delay, as if you remember what I said, goes up to 10 years. Uh, so there are models which predict with, with, with a delay of 10 years. So that means uh, how far ahead in future you can actually come up with these predictions, that's pretty large. That, can, that goes up to like one year, two years. I mean, you can come up with predictions up to 10 years, but those predictions are, are not, very, not very good. So you, you have good predictions up to one year out, two years out, which is kind of interesting. And uh, this, I already talked about this, that as you include uh, more and more delayed models, you see more and more links, but that kind of stabilizes up some time, as you can see on the left, uh, for California. Uh, one other question is, this uh, models uh, is we're essentially saying that we are inferring some kind of statistical causality. Uh, so do they um, satisfy the basic expectations of causal behavior. For example, uh, does the, uh, the strength of influence decay with space and time? Uh, for with, with, uh, with time, you can see, as is shown in the plate A on the, on the top right, they do kind of decay, and uh, those are like kind of the worst examples. In, many, in most places, you would see that, yeah, they do actually decay with time. It's much more difficult to see the spatial decay, mainly because at larger distances, you start kind of interacting with other locations, so those, that decay is hard to see. But in, in time, you can definitely see the, the kind of causal uh, behavior that you should see. And uh, what else? Okay, that's uh, pretty much uh, what uh, our current results are. What we are trying to do uh, after this is to vary our quantizations. We didn't, couldn't look at or didn't look at every possible spatial tile on the planet because of the computational cost. We only looked at about 1,000 tiles. Um, we want to expand that to essentially other places where with low seismicity and carry out the full computation, which is essentially which goes into uh, like order of millions of uh, core, millions of core hours, really. So we're trying to do that, get that done, and uh, ultimately it would be very nice to um, uh, throw up the system online where it uh, automatically ingests data from USGS and kind of. Uh, puts out uh, a prediction, a daily prediction or a weekly prediction of events. And then uh, we can actually check, really, in an automated way, how well the algorithm is doing. So that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's my next, uh, one of the things that I really like to, would like to do next. So 
Now, one, one thing that probably was obvious from what I taught, what I spoke about, is uh, this algorithm has nothing to do with geophysics in particular. So it's, uh, it's reverse engineering, um, really, data logs, spatiotemporal data logs. So what about uh, how ought we apply to some other uh, difficult problems where the data comes in that form? And one of the other things that we're doing is uh, predicting crime in the city of Chicago, or trying to create crime in the city of Chicago. But that's not a new idea. There's a couple of groups which are trying to do it in the University of Chicago itself. And there's also some private uh, companies, startups, which, try, which are trying to work with the CPD to do this. But what, the way we are doing it is very different. Again, it's a zero-knowledge approach, so we do not want to actually uh, preempt what kind of models we should have. We don't want to, to, want to manually encode what features uh, or what kind of um, yeah, features you need to look at to create crime. And um, uh, it is even more important in this context that, the, that, that our analysis be zero knowledge. And the reason is uh, the possibility of introduction of bias. Humans are inherently biased. If you come up with models yourself, there's no, uh, it's very hard to guarantee that you're not actually building in uh, some kind of uh, profiling, some kind of uh, racial bias and so on. So what we're doing is very different. There's really uh, very little human intervention uh, the source code uh, is is open and the data is public, so it's, it would be very difficult. It's as, as as transparent as it gets. So you have a data data structure, a database looks like this again, um, kind of event, location, and uh, timestamp. And what do we get from that? And and again, as we did before for the earthquake data, we split it up or into tiles, about city blocks, and look at the event stream in those in that in those city blocks. So it produces a time series of events, and then we're asking, do these time series interact? Do they influence one another? And if you build up this giant predictive network on these uh, models, uh, on this, uh, with these links, then can we actually predict events in future? Right. And we can. The short answer is we can. I, can. I can keep talking about this forever, but the short answer is we can. The AUC we get is very close to 90%. The, the average true positive rate is about uh, 80%. Average false positive, positive rate is about 20%, which is pretty good. And as very similar to the case of the seismic um, analysis, we looked at only tiles which are uh, like which have a lot of events, which have at least 10% of the days registered uh, a, a criminal infraction. Uh, again, the only reason for doing that is that if you look at every every tile, every city block in the city of Chicago, the computation becomes overwhelming. Uh, and uh, there's other things we can infer, just like for California, we inferred what are the influenced neighborhood. We can also find influenced neighborhoods in this case, and that is actually very, very instructive uh, for how, very, very instructive for how these neighborhoods move around or change uh, as you move your point of interest uh, around the city. And you see some details of the computational, of the computation carried out, tiles analyzed about 1,200, uh, temporal memory is roughly about 20 days and spatial memory of three miles. And these things were inferred actually from our uh, network. It was kind of uh, interesting that uh, you don't have across the city uh, effective links uh, for, this, uh, for criminal infractions. And this is what the, because the network of all links look like. On the left you have the, the color uh, tells you the, the gamma, which is the causality coefficient. And on the right, you have the time delay of the, of the models on the links. And uh, if you are from sort of Chicago, this picture would make a lot of sense to you. You essentially are looking at three clusters, one on the south side, one on the west side, and one near the downtown, which uh, makes a lot of sense if you are, if you are from Chicago. Uh, so that's pretty much what, uh, what I have to talk about. Uh, in summary, we kind of, uh, or not kind of, we presented a way of reverse engineering spatial temporal logs. Uh, to distill predictive models. And uh, what we are going to do, uh, or we are doing right now, it probably would be up in a couple of months, is online predictors of these things for the seismic uh, uh, data and the, and, the, and the crime data, where you'll be able to see those predictions change uh, as new data comes in. And uh, yeah, we'll, so, so it, will, it will throw up predictions, say, seven days into the future. And then you can come back over seven days and see whether how well it did. So, so I'm looking forward to that. That's what I have. Thank, wow. thank you very much, Ishanu. That was terrific.
Um, I have a question. Yeah. For you. Um, so, um, Ime Ebert Hukov um, gave us a talk um, in the last meeting, and she talked about Granger causality. She talked about probabilistic graphical models that have a temporal component. She works a lot with weather data, and um, you didn't talk a lot about how your approach relates to um, these kinds of probabilistic models. It seems that you're representing states just like they are. It seems like you're calculating probabilities, but I'm not sure. And you have some sense of how to define causality, but yeah, I, so, I'd, I'd like so to know more about how it relates. Uh, so I didn't go into that for the for the uh, for the limited time. So. Uh, this algorithm, where we are inferring this uh, spatial temporal network, it is a direct generalization of our Granger causality. When I say generalization, I mean the generalization of the implementations that people usually do. If you look at Granger's papers, what he said, or what essentially his idea of uh, Granger causality was, or he called it causality. Actually, he did call it call it Granger causality. If you're not happy about calling it causality, but uh, anyway, so his point was. X is Granger has a Granger causal influence on Y if X uh, has uh, unique information that allows you to predict Y better. So that's a very simple thing. The point is, it's a simple definition. The point is to actually implement this, it becomes very difficult because you're talking about, uh, if you're talking about something that predicts Y better, you need a way of modeling Y. So that builds in assumptions about Y. If you make linear assumptions, then you get the standard implementations of Granger, uh, Granger causal inference. So one of the things that this particular approach that I talked about does is goes back to that definition and uh, is able to actually not make any more assumptions other than those X and Y are ergodic and stationary um, to carry that, carry that out. So the question is, if you do not assume a, modeling, a model structure, how do you actually carry out that, uh, that, that program, right? How do you actually carry out a compute the Granger uh, causal uh, like the, the, quantify the Granger causal influence if we don't have to make any assumptions about the model. So by doing this kind of zero knowledge inference of this cross, probabil uh, cross probabilistic automata, you can actually do that. You don't have to assume anything, but you can get the, both the generative models and a quantification of the Granger influence simultaneously. So that's really the, uh, mathematically, that's, that's really the contribution. I can't, I can't hear you. Sorry, I'm mute because there's a lot of noise around. Um, Ime put together a working group in ISGO to collect it challenge data sets. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there may be data sets there that you might be able to, to use right. if you're interested. Yes, I'm very interested. One of the things, and we haven't yet, uh, this is not yet a, yet a part of, of this VM, mainly because I wasn't sure whether, uh, how to fit this in this kind of a very, standard wrappering that you know what we're doing in, in d3m right uh, mm -hmm. but hopefully the part of that and we are actually preparing for that so we have kind of wrapped it in a very uh, user-friendly way uh, so in a and we're not done yet but we're very close we're going to be there's going to be a point where we can just actually flip a button and it does the entire analysis it will take a couple of days to do it and it has to have an access to a cluster but the uh, applying it to new data sets would be would, would be trivial so that's, uh, yeah, we would really like to see that. And one of the other things, and I'm very excited about this, not just for, from, the, from the geosciences perspective or from this particular, solving one particular problem perspective, but you see this different data streams when, you are com we, are, when we are computing this um, uh, causal influence, uh, really Granger causal influence across these data streams. Uh, it, they do not have to be the same variable. They do not have to be the same variable type or the same kind of quantization. So essentially, you can look at how weather affects the stock market, or how weather and stock market together affect uh, influenza uh, incidences. So it's like it's it's really um, it's only limited by how big a cluster you have access to. So it's uh, and, and in Chicago has been very uh, helpful with that with that uh, particular aspect because we have lots and lots of free cluster time. So you can pretty much do what you want. So. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions? I, like, you hinted towards something, and I apologize that this is taking it back out of IS, but you now have a system that 
you uh, that is uh, demonstrating knowledge, uh, the, though you uh, know, uh, though you don't have a deterministic, uh, 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 you don't have the, you know that there is a deterministic component behind it because it's predictive, right? Is there a way, and you can report this in a couple of uh, your slides, uh, uh, of actually going back and then using the uh, the connectivity to uh, uh, give you information about the actual deterministic processes? Okay, so... Um, like well, you showed the, the, the plate connectivity and if, 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 from, uh, from there, but. So just because something is predictive, does that mean there's a deterministic component? Uh, that's probably, I mean, uh, is that true? Really, do you, do you believe that's true? For example, if there's a biased coin, then that's like a very good example of something that is not deterministic. It's, it's clearly a stochastic process, but it still uh, I would be able to say something about the distribution of the outcomes. It doesn't mean that you can say exactly uh, what, uh, what the next outcome would be, but over time, you can actually capture the distribution. So essentially, that's what we are doing, really. Yeah, so you have a biased coin, right? And there's a reason why it's biased. That is a deterministic. Yes, yes. yes. physically, might be, yes. Well, we can we can give an answer. We can give if you really want to. Uh, I mean, that's probably a digression, but you can you can think that in terms of uh, quantum decay, where it would be hard to give a reason why it is why it is not uh, why is it stochastic? It is a stochastic. It's inherently stochastic. So I'm not saying that um, uh, tectonic phenomena are behave like like that. So yeah, it might be that there is a deterministic picture, but if you have a really complex uh, dynamical system. Um, a complex deterministic dynamical system, the descriptions, uh, the description would be very close to a simpler, it can be, in many cases, it can be shown, uh, it, it, can be, uh, it can be represented by a simpler stochastic system, right? So if you have a really complex chaotic system, you might have a simpler uh, stochastic system which uh, approximates the behavior. So it might be very difficult to learn the exact really complex dynamical system with thousands of parameters which we can possibly never measure um, instead of doing that, we can model it at a, at a system which is inherently stochastic. So it'll be, it'll be very difficult to kind of go back and uh, to answer your question. It'll be, it'll, be very, it'll be very difficult to go back and uncover those deterministic paths unless something is clearly and obviously there is a deterministic um, driver somewhere. Uh, in general, it'll be very difficult to do that. It's, in general, it's very difficult to even look at the causality network that it infers because as I showed you, it has, even after throwing away models which are low information, you still have about 200,000 models. So it is kind of a system that is inferred uh, and is very uh, easy for the computer to make use of it and make predictions, uh, but it's not very, uh, doesn't give you a, a too much depth uh, visually. It's very hard for humans to look at it and get insight from it. But, it, but, but that's not, um, that's less discouraging to me, maybe because of my background, but the point is that uh, once you have this kind of a causality network, really complex, lots of models, okay, but you can actually run experiments on that model and see uh, how different effects uh, propagate through a system. You can do a lot with that. That's what I'm trying to get at. But yeah. usually, um, intuition might be difficult. That, that's right. And then the uh, word that you had uh, that you were searching for, uh, you, uh, as opposed to validation, is actually corroboration. So right. Yes, and, and, and that, uh, that was the word that was on the tip of your mind, I think. Yeah, actually the corroboration of not the law, the corroboration of the algorithm, really. Yeah, because yeah, the law exactly. is, uh, yeah, the law is uh, kind of well established. Great, well, thank you. Are there any other questions and then, and then we'll wrap up the talk. Thank you, that was really terrific. Um, give just a few seconds here for people to unmute if you have a question. All right. And you can always shoot me an email. I would love to hear what, uh, anything you have to say. Wonderful. So, or data, or data. I, I love data. <laughs> so Thank you. Uh, yeah, Yolanda, I'll let you wrap us up. Uh, thank you very much, Ishanu. And um, I think uh, we all 
need to be thinking more about causality in ISGO and uh, how to combine machine learning models with physics and other kinds of science knowledge. So this is very important for us to learn more about. Thank you. People get really upset. So that's why I have uh, stopped using that. And if people get really upset. I mean, their, their, their faces get red and stuff. So like, what do you mean by causality? Can you prove this is causality? And the whole uh, talk gets uh, kind of derailed. So that's why mm -hmm. I, I prefer not to use that word because yeah, that's true. We cannot really access true causality. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah.